Welcome back this morning, or welcome if it's your first time in our uh, lovely ballroom here. Um, I'd like to call the session to order. We're going to get started. We've got uh, several things to do this morning, um, all awards related, which is the best part of uh, being the past president, so let's jump right in. The first thing I want to do is um, announce to you um, the awarding of the 2017 National PhysTech Teacher of the Year. Alexander Boyd is at Holly Springs High School in Holly Springs, North Carolina. The selection committee noted her success as both a teacher and a departmental chairperson in increasing AP physics class enrollments in her school, especially in the numbers of young women taking physics. She's involved in science education beyond the classroom and supports student learning by advising her school's Science Olympiad and Science National Honor Society. She's invested in her own professional growth as an intern at the Statistical and Applied Mathematical Sciences Institute through a Keenan Fellowship and has served in various leadership roles for the AAPT, AIP Society of Physics Students, and APS Conferences for Undergraduate Women in Physics. As part of her award, she receives funds to attend the PhysTech Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, as well as the AAPT Summer Meeting, welcome, where she'll receive public recognition for her achievements. And she also receives a $1,000 Classroom Materials Grant. So if you would join me in congratulating Alexander Boyd. All right, um, this, for this next part, I would like to invite anyone who was um, awarded an AAPT fellowship this spring to please join me on the stage, if you're present. No, not everybody's present. Come on up. The AAPT Fellowship is among our newest awards. The criterion for selection of fellows is exceptional contribution to AAPT's mission to enhance the understanding and appreciation of physics through teaching. Fellowship is a distinct honor signifying recognition by one's professional peers. Any AAPT member who's maintained an active membership for at least seven years is eligible for nomination. Nominations are evaluated by the AAPT Awards Committee and approved by the Board of Directors. The 2017 AAPT Fellows are John Anderson from Centennial High School, Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> Dolores here. Dolores Gendy from North Broward Pre Preparatory School, Coconut Creek, Florida. <laughs> Ken Heller from the University of Minnesota, we'll, we'll hear from momentarily. Ramon Lopez, University of Texas at Arlington. Frank Nochiz, and I apologize to Frank because I had hoped to meet up with him and make sure I got his name correct, and I probably didn't. Uh, Frank Nochiz at John Jay High School, Cross River, New York. Bob Powell, University of West Georgia in Carrollton, Georgia. And yesterday's award winners, Mark Schober from Trinity School in New York City. And Cindy Schwartz of Vassar College. So congratulations to all our fellows. I'm gonna ask if you guys can come back at the end of session, we're gonna do a photo, okay? Thank you. And then I'm gonna apologize because I forgot to pull Ken's citation out of my bag. I'll be right back. When there's so many great things going on, it's bound to forget one of them, right? All right. The Robert A. Milliken Medal recognizes those who have made notable and intellectually creative contributions to the teaching of physics. Dr. Ken Heller of the School of Physics and Astronomy of the University of Minnesota 
is the College of Science and Engineering Distinguished Professor and the Morse Alumni Distinguished Teaching Professor. He received his BA from the University of California and his PhD from the University of Washington. He's also served as a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Michigan and earlier served in the Peace Corps in Nigeria and Kenya. Also an accomplished high energy physicist, Dr. Heller is well known for his work in collaborative group problem solving, particularly with the complex context rich problems. At Minnesota, incorporation of strategies such as these led to a transformation of the department's courses, including lecture, laboratory, and discussion sections, as well as a better integration of and training for teaching assistants. The materials he and his colleagues created are available to the community for free and have influenced notable works that followed. Dr. Heller was one of the founders of the University of Minnesota's Physics Education Research Group, one of the earliest in the country. The doctoral students and postdoctoral researchers who have been part of this group are among the best known in our community, having become influential leaders in their own right. Within AAPT, Dr. Heller is a former president and a member of the Committee on Graduate Education. His service to physics education has also involved roles in the Committee on Education and member of the Executive Committee and Chair of the Forum on Education, both within the Physi American Physical Society. He's been honored by several other awards, including, but not limited to, being named a fellow of the APS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and now AAPT. One of his colleagues said of Dr. Heller, I found him to be a superb spokesman for physics education at all levels, from K-12 through college and postgraduate. Another noted, Ken Heller's work in physics education research and development provides one of the fundamental pillars supporting the current state of PER. His recognition by Millikan Ward is not only appropriate, but overdue. For these contributions to the teaching of physics, AAPT is proud to present the 2017 Robert A. Millikan Medal to Dr. Kenneth Heller. Hello out there. I see everybody uh, sitting at round tables. And so had I known that, I've, pre I've prepared some problems so you could get in groups of three <laughs> and work on them. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have that. But uh, we don't have, oh, there we go. OK, so uh, got a bright light here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to give my impression of, uh, of our journey, our collective journey from where we are now and where we've been to where we think we ought to go. And in doing that, uh, I, I need to really thank all of my colleagues in many different places, especially in AAPT, and a lot of you are out there and uh, thank you for all the challenges, intellectual challenges and other challenges and discussions, and you know who you are. <laughs> and I'm not going to name everyone because it would be a list of about, I don't know, 50 names or something important. I'll, I will talk for, to about some of them. So uh, I also want to thank my students in my classes who, from the first day I was teaching, desperately wanted to learn. And so it's hard to ignore that desperation and, and try to do something about it. Um, and of course, all the contributions that have been made in the field of cognitive science, which continually, we continually draw on for our theory on, on our experimental evidence. So I just also wanted to say that uh, AAPT has been my intellectual home uh, for things educational, and I wanted to point out that the first paper I ever wrote was in the physics teacher. And this uh, disreputable person up there, which is, uh, is what it used to look like when I had hair. <laughs> okay, I, I, you know, I just want to reflect back a little bit on uh, the early influences on my life at least my intellectual life and education, starting at Berkeley, where I learned all about activist learning. 
And, uh, and this is uh, just a picture of the free speech movement there. An interesting part, I don't know if you can see it up in the corner, either there or there, is when we started that, and I was there at the beginning, the police were our friends. And if you look at that picture, you see them. We're people there, not me, but people who are giving speeches or standing on the top of a police car. And the policemen are just sort of hanging out there. And things like that changed. So uh, otherwise, at Berkeley, of course, a lot of people influenced me. But the person who influenced me most was probably my philosophy of science teacher, Paul, uh, Paul Feuerabend. And uh, if you know anything about his impact on philosophy, uh, his probably greatest contribution, at least to me, is that the scientific, there, the scientific method really is there is no scientific method. Okay. Then I was in the Peace Corps, and I got influenced by uh, people who were just starting out in the program, elementary science program and the Educational Development Corporation, I got introduced to Piaget. And, uh, and then I was in Nigeria and Kenya, as Janelle said. And there, I was influenced by two people. One, Bill Walton, who was an educator from Massachusetts, not the basketball player. <laughs> and Phil Morrison, uh, the nuclear physicist, who sat with me in a, in a meeting in, in Ghana, out in the boondocks and told me about Big Bang Theory while he was also teaching elementary school teachers in, uh, in, uh, from around the continent. While I was doing my thesis at SLAC in high energy physics, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, uh, I wandered over to the Exploratorium and I hang out, hung out there actually be quite before it was the Exploratorium and spent a lot of time, at least for me, uh, with Frank Oppenheimer. And as I go through, I'm going to note, you note these people have, have won or served AAPT. And I'm looking back, I'm amazed by how many of these people were associated with AAPT that I didn't know at the time were associated with AAPT. Then uh, I went to the University of Washington and fell in with a bad group. Uh, <laughs> these were the graduate student troublemakers and educational activists. Uh, while other people were being political activists, there was an educational activist group, and this is, these are, these are the, the people, and uh, also a sympathetic postdoc. This uh, group of troublemakers was en enabled by what I'd call the establishment, anti-establishment professors. Uh, these are, are some of the most important ones, and again, I note that all three of them were presidents of the AAPT. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. And uh, Milliken and Ersted Medal winners. In addition to, to the, the old guard there that enabled us, there was the new guard, new professors that came in. And here are some of the most important ones, at least to influencing me. And you'll recognize an AAPT president and, of course, Lillian who uh, has won the uh, Ersted and Millikan Medal. And Roberto Pache, who influenced me a lot in his radicalism in physics. And if you know the Pache-Quinn axion theory, uh, he was there. And of course, I, I met my mentor, who was one of the disreputable group of graduate students making trouble. Uh, and, uh, and then we moved to Michigan, where she continued to uh, teach me about all things cognitive science and statistics and education. Then I moved to Minnesota. And again, there were, there were a lot of professors there who, who helped. But two of them, uh, Russ Hobby, who was associated and worked with the AAPT for a long time, still is. And Conrad, Conrad Mausberger, whose picture I couldn't find, but he was involved in this mission, uh, he, uh, he was one of the first very skeptical professors there who, who would use the stuff that we were developing. And it, his approval was very important for us to, uh, to get that accepted by other people. 
And then, of course, PE are professors in the group. And an uh, enormous number of very talented PhDs who got their degrees. Uh, many of them are with us today. Uh, and talented postdocs who are also important. And this is just a sort of class picture of the PER group at Minnesota during the AAPT meeting in 2014. Okay, so that's the, that, that's the history. So now let's see, you know, can we get there from here? And there are obviously different opinions on that, as you can see from the books. And in physics terms, we know just what to do about that. We, we just write this down, and all we have to do is determine the current state, determine the final state, and see if the operator exists that'll move us from the initial state to the final state. And that's, that's the physics definition of our business. So what I'm going to talk about today, this is kind of an outline. Uh, um, so I'm going to talk about how we determine where we are, and everybody here knows where we are, uh, and why are we stuck here? Because we've been here for a long time. Uh, and I'm going to talk then about education as a complex process and try to uh, apply the engineering of complex processes, namely systems engineering. And I think systems engineering should be very important. If we don't know systems engineering, we should learn it because that's what we're trying to do. Uh, a little bit of pedagogy theory, and then talk about three different systems in uh, increasing grain size. The course, the curriculum, and physics education as a whole, K through wherever. Uh, and then see what we can say about this question. Are we almost there? And in the process, I will oscillate between things which are abstract, and I'll try to throw in a few concrete examples. OK, so first of all, how do we know where we are? Well, those of us who teach basically can just look. And we have the famous educator, Yogi Berra, who uh, has given us how to, how, to how, to met, how to determine that, just subjectively. And we can see what our students do, and maybe it doesn't please us. But there are all kinds of measurements due to a lot of people in this room and not in this room, uh, both in the PAR community and in cognitive science and other people. And this is just the laundry list of things that we know going from sort of the most obvious, that is the DFW rate, and I noticed there's a session on that, which is good, that people are worrying about that, all the way down to uh, st our students actually taking our classes don't know what physics is about today. That is, what they learn in their mechanics class seems to have nothing to do with what physicists actually do, and that should be disturbing. OK, so our uh, APT meetings, and in this meeting in particular, really addresses these difficulties of where we are. And there are individual instructors who are working on things with their classes, and that's useful. There are people who do research validated uh, techniques and methods of pedagogy, and that's useful. And then there are people who apply those research validated methods, but they adapt them. And so they're research-based methods, also valuable. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how these fit into systems engineering. And as you know, unfortunately, this quote from Melva Phillips still applies, that uh, the trouble with problems in physics education is they don't stay solved. So you build a beautiful system, this beautiful house there, and then something undermines it. And we seem to be, you can, as physicists, we can describe that as being in a potential well. And we work really hard to push that boulder up the potential well. And the question is why? Why are we in a potential well? And here are some possible reasons. And I'm sure you have your own, because I'm sure you've experienced these things. OK. so. Education is a complex system, and we ought to look at other complex systems. 
And one complex system we can learn from is something like producing cars. It's not as complex as the education system, but it is complex. It has inputs and outputs and production methods and workers. And in our case, workers could be either the students or the instructors or both. And uh, it has many constraints and many different kinds of users, from babies to people commuting. And you know, we can learn from systems engineering. Here's, an, here's a for dummies book, which I like the dummies books because uh, I can read them. And so we can learn a lot about how manufacturing deals with the problem of continuously, Im continuous improvement without backsliding. Here's a systems diagram, simplified system diagram of physics education. Okay, you can sort of look at that for a minute, find the box you're interested in. Every one of these boxes has inside of it a detailed process diagram. And it has inputs and outputs, and we'll get back to this diagram uh, after a while. Okay, now in doing this, if you don't already know, I want to introduce you to one of the founders or gurus of system engineering, a guy named Edmunds Dem Edwards Deming. And of course, he was a physicist. And uh, one of the, he has a lot of good quotes if you go on the internet and find them. This is one, if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. And so we, we should take that to heart with what we're doing in education. Determine what the process, a little bit about him. He was, as a young person, sent to help uh, redevelop Japan after the Second World War when there was nothing there. And he's credited with giving the Japanese the, um, the conceptual basis for the rise of Japanese industry and the industry that we were all scared of sort of in the 1980s. And in fact, Japan established a medal in his name to honor him. He came back to this country and did a, a bunch of things, but sort of nobody knew who he was until about the 1980s when he got involved in the automobile industry, which was cratering about that time, and introduced them to these uh, ideas of system engineering and total quality management. And he's sort of credited with saving the US automobile industry as well as the Japanese manufacturing industry. So we should take to heart what he, what he, what he said. And I, I want to go through one of his illustrative experiments. And you can see how it applies, I believe, to what we're doing. And it's called the Red Bead Experiment. And you can Google it. It's a nine minute YouTube uh, video. And get the one that Deming does, because it's fun to see Deming. There are other people who do it as well. Um, and this, this video is about producing white beads from a mixture of red and white beads, something very simple. And it presupposes that all the workers are very motivated, that all the systems are well, what they, what they do are well defined, the systems are working to their optimal, everything is great, the workers have incentives and consequences for producing. Okay, and so this, the, the experiment and what the, the illustration of production is you want to produce a bunch of white beads, which are good products, from a mixture of red and white beads. And the red beads are bad products. And so here's the process. It's better on the video. You have, to have this input supply of red and white beads. And you very carefully, with great instructions, pour these red and white beads, which are the input to your process, into a container. You then use a specially designed uh, tooling to extract the beads. This tooling is basically just a flat panel 
with 50 holes in it, and the beads fit into those holes. So you put it into the mixture very carefully, and you take it out, and all your holes are filled with beads. And then at the end, you get this uh, panel of beads, and that's your product. And you take it to uh, a uh, independent evaluator who evaluates your work based on the number of red beads you have. Red beads are bad. And you get raises, you do merit raises based on the number of red beads you have. Okay. Now all of you can recognize the silliness of this process. And here's what you get. These are the workers, these are the ones in the, uh, in the video. Uh, there are six of them, and this gives the number of red beads they get. And you can see here are three trials. They, they get this number of red beads. And you can see that at the end of trial two, at trial three, the number of red beads has gone down in total. So you would then conclude your training has worked. Your first two, and now you're, you, now you're ready for production. Okay, now you do note that one of your workers, Karen, is a slow learner. But the rest is fine. You still go into production, and this is what you get. The next time everyone dips their little panel into the beads. And you could call this the final exam. So the first three things are your quizzes. You see some improvement. The last is the final exam. And you're shocked to find that the final exam has regressed from the last quiz. So something went wrong in the final exam. Okay. Now, if the workers are students, what would you do? Well, it's very simple. You can look at uh, Alice and Karen, and they get A's. They have the fewest red beads, significantly fewer. You look at Leon and Bob, they pass. And Susan and Paul fail. And so that's how you judge the workers. If the workers are instructors, then Alice and Karen get a teaching award. Susan and Paul are replaced. And the other two are ignored. That's how the system works. And one of the nice quotable things that Deming said is, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And here's the result that you get if you have a large number of workers, which you recognize as a Gaussian with the peak at the number of beads that you have, red beads, in the input. OK, and so what you learn from this process, and what he says in the video, is it doesn't help to change what the workers do or to change their training. It doesn't help to go over it again. It doesn't help for them to practice more. It doesn't help to ask them to go more slowly. It doesn't help how you reward their effort. It doesn't help how you punish them. Nothing is going to change because your process is driven statistically. It also doesn't help to have slogans <laughs> and to exhort the workers and tell them to construct their own knowledge. OK, so we have to ask, if we see distributions like this, which are indicative of randomness, does it make any sense to evaluate students based on such distributions? Or is that a statement about the randomness of our process? It's a question. So what do you do about this? Well, what you do in systems engineering, you examine the process. You don't examine the workers. And so you have to decide, can you change the tooling so you only get white beads? You might be able to design something that will have, maybe the red beads are smaller, and you can have different size holes, something. So you look, you look into that. Uh, you look into your input process. I mean, maybe what you should do is change the mixture of red and white beads that come into the system in the first place. Or you can ask, are red beads really bad? Do you really want to use that to evaluate your process? Or, you know, why do you want beads anyway? <laughs> okay.
Okay, so either you have two options, or you can do both, actually. You need to change the process or change the goals of the process. And this is what Deming says, and this is the point of his little experiment. Okay, so now let's apply systems engineering to our systems. And we have, I've pointed out three, again, at different grain sizes. A course, a curriculum, or the whole thing. And of course, it's a system, so if all the pieces work synchronously and are coherent, we will have an efficient process that works together and the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts. On the other hand, we have been told we can have the whole is less than the sum of its parts, namely it's just junk. And we have been told by Arnold Ahrens uh, about that reinventing the wheel isn't all that bad. This I took from one of his uh, papers. Uh, but what they keep on doing, meaning the educational process, is reinventing the flat tire. The other thing we can learn from Deming, what, one of the things he said is don't copy. So when he came to America and people wanted to just use the system the Japanese used, he says no, that's a disaster. Every system re is influenced by the local conditions. And so you cannot take, according to Deming, something that has been done really well at the University of Minnesota and do it at wherever you are. And in fact, even at the University of Minnesota, it's very, you should not assume that you can take whatever you've done in algebra-based physics and do it in calculus-based physics something we found out. So, so this is, uh, I think, an important lesson. So getting there, so how do we evaluate the process? So in doing a process, there are kind of two uh, important operations. One is called quality control, and the other is called uh, quality assurance. Quality control has to do with measurement. So what you do is you measure whether or not the outcome of your processes meet your standards, whatever they are, however you've defined them. And in, in, in our racket, we have a lot of these things, and we keep developing more, and it's essential to have quality control. But quality control is not the whole answer. You need also quality assurance. Quality assurance is not about individual measurement, but it's about synthesis about looking over the entire process. And we have those too. We have people who have developed entire processes for doing things by applying quality assurance. And so uh, what, what we have is quality control, that is just measurement without quality assurance, means you find all the holes in the bucket and you band-aid them up one by one as you find them. And you kind of never get there. Quality assurance without quality control means you imagine some better process and you just run out and do it. And then you have people running off in all different directions and usually that collapses after a while. So you can't have either. And uh, of course the other great guru of systems engineering is Dilbert. And this is what happens if measurement controls your process. And what Deming says, again, is we should be guided by theory, not by numbers. Even though he's a numbers guy, he was actually a mathematical physicist who knew a lot about statistics. OK, so what about theory? What theory should be guided by? Uh, to my mind, we have an educational theory, which is not fundamental, but it's phenomenological. And it's based on what has worked forever, and that's apprenticeship. And this is the cognitive apprenticeship model. And it's applying the analysis of apprenticeship to what happens in a classroom. And uh, one of the important parts of that is that people learn in some kind of context, some environment, what's called the environment of expert practice. And in addition to that, they signaled out three very important functions that has to have to happen for learning. And here they are, you've heard of them before. The idea of modeling, 
not in the sense of making a physical model, but the fact that you should show people what you want them to do if you want them to do it. Then coaching, that is, you then need to let people do it their own way and give them instant feedback. And fading means you take away all of the scaffolding that you put in to allow people to get used to doing it. And of course, these are not um, serial operations. One has to go back and forth. You don't say, I gave a great lecture on this. They came to my office hour and I coached them. And then they go away and they do the test. Modeling, coaching, fading. Now we're done. And now I'll go on to the next topic. Well, maybe I do go on to the next topic if everything sort of hooks together, if the next topic is really not different than the previous topic. So we have to have some, according to this theory, if you show a student how to do something, then they try to do it themselves from coach it, with coaching, and they may decide they're not quite get it, and so they need to see the model again. Then maybe they say they want to try it on their own. And they don't, they don't succeed at doing that, so maybe now they want some coaching. Or maybe they want to go back and see the modeling again, back and forth and back and forth. So the question is how you accommodate that. And one test, if you want quality, quality control, of whether the students are operating in an environment of expert practice is that they can answer these three questions at any time during the process of whatever the course is or the curriculum. Call them up at 3 o'clock in the morning and ask them, how do you use that? So it's personal. It has to be personal. OK, so here, so now we have, if, if we use this theory to guide us, I think it's a good theory, um, we basically need to understand how to include these functions in our courses. And of course, that depends on where we are. What's our venue? Do we have nice a room of nice round tables and we can do scale up? Or do we have individual classrooms with seating in rows so we have to do something else? Uh, that's the venue for model, coach, and fade. Then we have to understand the method. I mean, everyone can have a different. How are you going to model something? Are you going to do it with a video? with a lecture. There are many ways to model things. How are you going to do the coaching? How are you going to do the fading? And you have to identify the scaffolding you're going to use. And the important thing about scaffolding is the, the idea is like scaffolding on a building. You have to take it away. So yes, you can use worksheets for scaffolding, but you have to get rid of them. You have to Whatever it is you use, and here's some scaffolding that people use. Structured groups is scaffolding. But then they have to operate in groups without the structure or operate individually. So, uh, whoops. So here's sort of the components in a, uh, in a diagram. And any component of a course needs these elements, goals. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know when you'll be there. Uh, content, of course. There's a context, because context is important. There is tasks, things that you want students to practice and do. And there's an assessment. And these are all connected together. And then there's pedagogy, which is not connected to any of those things. You can have a pedagogy and then do, arrange those five things. So the pedagogy is independent of the context. It's independent of the content. You just decide, have to decide on a pedagogy that works. And the quality assurance is by looking at the interlinkages between those parts of the course and seeing if they're working. And so that's what quality assurance investigates. And in addition, these linkages need to be obvious to the students, because actually they're part of the quality assurance program. As they are in manufacturing, the worker has to have power over the process. OK. And so here's just an example from assessment. 
assessment we think about tests. They don't have to be tests, some kind of assessment. Um, and the tests have to emphasize the goals and the content. I mean, sometimes it's easy to see colleagues' tests that emphasize the content and not the goals of the course. In addition to that, the tests have to have the same form as the tasks. So if you're having somebody practice something, how you assess them should be like how you're having them practice. And it should also include the context, whatever context you have to build that, uh, uh, that environment of expert practice. Okay, so let's look at determining the goals. And this is the goal, what goals do we want? Luckily, lots of people have told us what these goals are. And actually, they all agree. And some of those people are us. And so we can look at these things. Here are a few of the publications that just tell us what the goal should be of the physics course for various populations, including physics majors from the JTUF report. And the other way you can tell is something that we did early on, because we had no idea what the goals of our courses should be, was to do a survey of the faculty in other departments who required their students to take our course. So we need to know, you need to know why. Why is anybody there? And if you want those questionnaires, they're on our website. And this is just an example of what we found from the first one we did, which was the algebra-based uh, physics course, intro physics course, which had lots of different majors. And we had no idea why they were being required to take this course. So, and this was, these were the top goals. And it was very, to us, it was actually shocking about problem solving at that time. It was very important to all these disparate departments, none of whom are that technical. OK, so that's, uh, now let's move to context. So if we look at context, what's the point of context? It's like doing a jigsaw puzzle. So if you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, which is of a cathedral, you can look at the pieces and have some idea of where they go. And so the context helps you. In your mind, you have a mental image of what that thing should be like when you're done. Whereas if you just have all white pieces on the puzzle, the only thing you can go on is the shape. And it's much harder. So context makes uh, solving problems, solving puzzles easier. And of course, what it does is it connect, has to connect to students' personal knowledge. That is, if you don't actually know what a cathedral looks like, then it, it may not be very meaningful to you. And of course, the context has to make sense. OK, so what we need is context that fit with our students. And we have a wide variety of students. And either we can make special courses, if there are enough of them, to, set, to make that context like introductory physics for the life sciences to name one that a lot of people are working on. Or maybe there are too few students in any one, and we have to have a course which has agricultural students and interior design students and sports students all in one class. And there, what we need to do is just move the context around. And so at any given time, the context won't fit everybody, but over the length of a course, statistically, we'll get some of them. Okay. So um, just to be specific about a system, I mean, it's not really pie in the sky. I mean, this is something that we've done at the University of Minnesota. We have a system of introductory physics, which has been operating for 30 years. It's had over 40 different faculty teaching it, thousand, more than 1,000 TAs. And we do it routinely. And so one can make such a system. And what does our system look like? And again, remember, we're not saying copy. It's just an example. We have lectures, discussion sections, labs, and tests. OK, so does everybody. That's not very special. And indeed, we have separate rooms for them all. We can't do them all in a room. So uh, studio physics is out for these courses. They're big. 
Uh, and you can see that when they meet and so on, it looks very, very standard. So what's the system? The system is to use your elements in a way that satisfies your pedagogy and also satisfies the context, content, goals, and assessment. And so what we do, here's what we do in lectures. We do peer coaching in formal groups. Lots of people do that. We model constructing knowledge with problem solving because we're, we decided our, one of our main goals was problem solving. In discussion sections, we use peer coaching and TA coaching. And to do that, we use what we call context-rich problems, which give a context and also, and I'll show you an example of those, as, as well as a context, they emphasize the other goal, the goals of the course. And then laboratories again, and laboratories look like the discussion sections. In fact, they have the same students with the same TAs. And that, again, is part of the process, as I'll show later on, that, that allows the TAs to get to know the students so they can observe what is happening. And then we have tests. And because we use cooperative grouping a lot of places, our tests need to reflect that. And so part of our tests are done in groups. And part of the tests are individual, because actually what we're interested in is individual knowledge and not necessarily group knowledge. OK, so there, when, when we make this, made this process, in fact, we learned these things not sort of by some great analysis, but by, you know, knocks. Hard won, things went wrong. We looked at the processes and say what was going wrong. And if you have a system that looks like this one, then there are three main things that can go wrong. And you have to pay attention to them in your process. And you have to remember that there is plenty of evidence that having students work together in groups is not beneficial. Just saying, OK, get together in a group and do this doesn't help. So what are the inappropriate tasks? So it has to be a task that needs to be done in a group. It has to involve problems where you have to do problem solving. And what problem solving means is make decisions. I mean, you have to decide what problem solving is. And it's not plugging stuff into equations or taking three equations and doing algebraic manipulation and getting an answer. None of that is problem solving. Maybe useful skills, but it's not, a pro it's not so problem solving. Uh, it, it's also uh, an inappropriate task if it doesn't connect to the student's experience in some ways. So the problems have to have some context and of course, if one person in the group can easily solve the problem, there is no point in working in a group. And so there is no learning that happens in such a group. Then there's inappropriate grading. For example, grading on the curve is a disaster if you're interested in students learning from each other working in a group. Because if I help you, I hurt me on a curve. Students know that. So, so you can't do that. Uh, you have to have a reward system that's not just for the group, but for the individual learning. So there has to be both. Uh, and if the only product of solving a problem, the only thing you get assessed on is the answer, that's not going to work either. So you have to assess people based on how they do it, what the process is. And, uh, and in grading, that means grading not for artifacts, but for a whole process. So for instance, you can't take off five points if someone doesn't have a free body diagram if they don't need a free body diagram in the way they've solved the problem. And then there's poor management of groups, which happens. Uh, so the important thing in a group is that students are using their own brains. So they have to be able to search their own brains. So the thing that happens is you know, we have some nice instructors that say, oh, well, let the students use their notes. That's a disaster. Let the students look up things in books. We want to know right then when they're working a group, what do they know now, and pool their knowledge, not what they can look up. Later on, they can look up something. There's nothing wrong with that. But in a group, it, it destroys it. And the other thing is that if students don't talk together about every step of the solution, but instead, they each do a solution or part of a solution, and then they come together and compare. 
that's a way of accomplishing something, but it destroys the pedagogical uh, use of the cooperative group as a method of coaching. And so that, that's something that doesn't work. Okay, so here's an example of a task, and, and I'm going to use context-rich problems because that's why we developed them. It, it's not the only task one can use. But uh, these context-rich problems are realistic problems so that the students think that they're not just, you know, abstract stuff that the professor made up. Uh, but they're not real because reality is too complicated for students, and we want to use these problems as a way for students to use the fundamentals of physics. And uh, these problems are, uh, violate a clear belief of a lot of physics faculty about what we call clarity. These problems are vague on purpose. Okay, they're vague so that the students can put in the context themselves. So an example is reading a novel. They don't Destroy, in reading a novel, you don't look at every blade of grass. You just say, there was grass. You imagine it. Or a real simple example is you go to a bar and you order a beer. That brings up an image in everybody's mind. They've been to a bar and ordered a beer. Or even if they haven't, that is different for every person, but nevertheless is real and concrete. Um, and of course, it has to emphasize the use of fundamental physics in solving problems. And the context, as we said before, can't seem trivial or silly to the students. It has to seem like it's important and have to do with their professional interests. And a useful theme, there's also themes in constructing these problems. One is just making models, because that's an important goal. Okay, so here's, here's a context-rich problem if you've never seen one before. Uh, this, is, this is the prototypical physics problem of a block sliding down a frictionless inclined plane. But in this problem, there are decisions that have to be made, and problem solving is a goal, so decision making is a goal. We want students to practice it. You have to make assumptions. That's also a goal because that's important in problem solving. Uh, it connects to students' reality. This is a problem given to engineering students. So it's a design problem. Uh, it uh, has a motivation, which we think is important for problem solving for many students, not everyone. It, you can solve it using only fundamental physics, no special equations. Uh, it can be evaluated because the numbers make sense, and evaluation is a goal. It's very important that students learn how to evaluate th their solutions. And we use the same exact format on a test. This could be a test question. It could be a, a group question. It could be a homework question. They're always the same. OK, so now let's uh, look at some QC measures. And I'm not going to go through a lot of them. We do a lot of measuring stuff, pre, post, FCIs, stuff like that, and evaluating problem solving. But here's the easy one. The easy one is the DFW rate. And this is an indication. Uh, you can see from this graph, it goes to 2007, but I spot checked it, as you can see below, at two other dates. We just don't, you know, it's more or less flat. But the process was flat coming into 1997 and 1998 at about 5% DFW rate for our courses. And then it jumped. And at that point, it jumped. We changed from quarters to semesters. And at which place the curriculum, everyone was trying to fit the curriculum. No one was paying attention to the processes very much. And we noticed that. We said, maybe it'll settle down next year. It really didn't. And so then we started looking at the processes again to see what was not being paid attention to. They used to be paying attention, and we got it back down to the 5%, which we think is just fine for a DFW rate. OK, so that's. Uh, that's courses. Now the next biggest grain size is majors, and there have been sessions here on physics majors, and there's the JTUP report, which is important. And there we need to look at that in terms of system engineering. And uh, there's, there's content that needs to be changed. There are skills that need to be emphasized that maybe aren't there. In addition to that, we probably should restructure the way we 
teach things, and, and the Oregon State people have been leaders in doing that with their paradigms, uh, in breaking down the course structure and paying attention to the linkages. But the other thing is that, that I think, and other people have thought, Don Holcomb for one, who called our curriculum, and as a physics major, the frozen curriculum. And that is the content of our curriculum needs to, needs to keep up with real physics, changing physics. And it doesn't seem to be doing that. So we need to ask, if we're going to add some of that stuff, we have to take away some stuff. And so what are we going to throw out? What really important physics that we now teach are we not going to teach anymore? These are hard decisions. Uh, for example, I mean, I've been thinking recently, it's not physics, but we spend a lot of time on it. Should we give up paper and pencil mathematics completely? Trying to be radical here. There's software. Do people really need to know how to do algebra anymore? Solve a differential equation? Anyway, I think people are looking at this and, and a serious look at the content in, of a physics major, I will leave to other people. So, that, so we're back at the question, are we there? Or are we almost there? And again, now we can look at here, it was sort of the single instructor pushing the the boulder up the potential well. And there would mean that we don't, are not in a position to fall back in the potential well, even if the boulder slips a bit. So in other words, changing the potential well means changing the boundary conditions. So here we are again with the diagram of physics education as a whole, as a process. And of course, it's not a closed system. Most of the students that we teach leave this process, and that's fine. And the ones that come into our block of that con process are not the ones we produced in another block. That is, our students come from different institutions. In addition, our faculty come from different institutions. Our graduate students come from different institutions. So it's not just a, con a, a stream from one place to another. And this affects the whole system. But if you look at the common input elements, the most common, it's the faculty. And I would contend that the faculty are the mixture of red and white beads. This was what makes the system stable. The same faculty there, I mean new ones come in, but the culturation goes on and they become much the same. Stability is good. Don't get me wrong. It also means it's the largest leverage for change. If we can change the faculty, we can change the world. Okay, so here's what it looks like when you uh, look at the faculty and you know, the faculty input in red and what they input into. And then you can ask yourself, well, where can you change the faculty? Where's your biggest point of leverage? What's the most efficient place? And you can look at the faculty acculturation part, which is the smallest number of faculty to deal with, the ones who actually get tenure track jobs. And that's being done. The new faculty workshop is an example of trying to do that. But that's hard. And it's slow over time. Changing the postdoc is difficult. Maybe someone can come up with a way. I think that's hard to do because it's short time, high pressure research, hard to get in that system. However, changing graduate education is something that we can do. And uh, there, there are already things in place. There's a national TA training workshop, not training the TAs, but training people who deal with the TAs, uh, that is run by Georgia Tech and Utah, which has just kind of started, which is a, a good step. And if we look at AIP data, which is important, many people have shown, we can see that most of the faculty comes from a very few institutions. In fact, if you look at just all the physics PhDs, most of which who don't become faculty, 30% of those come from about 20 institutions. So the number of places we have to change is small if we can do that. And that's a very efficient way of, of changing the system. So, um, how can you do that in terms of education? Well, we already have a hook 
in the graduate curriculum. Every graduate student practically is a TA, which means they practice something which you might call education. In order to make that efficient, and of course, they're necessary things to have. In order to make them have the skills to construct knowledge of effective teaching, we need to change the TA and make TA really an integral part of PhD education, not just something that graduate students do before they get into research. And it's also true that the skills that TAs practice are the same skills that make them employable in management and so on. Okay, so the goal is to make the TA useless, or useful, not useless, <laughs> a Freudian slip. <laughs> uh, and another nice quote from Deming is, a bad system will beat a good person every time. And so when TAs are injected into a bad system, their chance of success is small. And so the first thing in examining the process is to examine the system and set the TAs up for success. And here are some things that one can do. Uh, one of the biggest ones is to design the course they teach so that it's not like water coming out of a fire hose. And so there's no chance the students are going to learn, no matter what the TAs, who are your willing workers in the red bead experiment, try to do. And of course, you can see what things trap TAs in, in non-successful practices. And you can try to structure your system to avoid those traps. And so this is just examining the process. And you can also support the TAs. So instead of just preventing certain things, you can actively help the TAs. And these are some of the things that people can do to help the TAs learn about education. And again, this is not pie in the sky because we've had a system like this at Minnesota for over 25 years. And it just runs. OK, so getting there. So we're trying to get there, and it's going to require everybody's effort. Everybody in this room and everybody who's not in this room to do that, and we can look at these efforts in PhD production, physics major production, and teaching a course. So we need to operate at all the grain sizes. And, uh, whoops. and keep in mind the process and total quality management in doing that. And now, so that's the end, except I'll just want to tell you what our group is doing, which is an infinitesimal small part of this stuff. I mean, we're not trying to revolution. We're doing one thing. Right now, we're working hard on solving the coaching problem so that it is not so time inefficient. I mean, we have cooperative group coaching. We have instructor coaching. We have tutorial rooms, all these things. But what does a student do at 3 o'clock in the morning when they need some help? And so we're trying to build uh, computer coaches that will coach that. In addition to that, we have uh, people who are looking at uh, instructors' beliefs about what students are doing when they're solving problems, because instructors' beliefs do govern, to some extent, what they actually do. And it's important to know what those beliefs are. They're not always obvious. And we're trying, this is probably the most difficult thing, we're trying to build an instrument which people can use to look at their problems and, and judge how difficult they are. So a measurement scale of this. Because I know my faculty, when they make easy problems, sometimes they think are easy, they're hard. Hard problems, they think are hard, they're easy. Me too. And so it would be nice to do that. So I want to thank you all for uh, letting me uh, talk, rant on here, <laughs> and also for this award, and uh, also for working to build this matrix element that we're all trying to construct. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Heller. We do have some time for questions. I know everybody thinks that they can speak loud enough that they don't need to go to the mic, 
But there actually might be people in the audience that could benefit from you using it, even if you don't think you need it. So we have one over here and one over here. If you have questions, thank you for starting us off right. So I just have a comment. First of all, thank you for an enlightening talk. Um, as a mathematician, I would just like to point out that we face many of the same challenges. Our students, however, are supported almost exclusively through teaching, not just in their first couple of years, and so we perhaps have a slight head start on thinking about the professional development of RTAs, and I would just like to encourage you and all others who are interested in pursuing this direction to collaborate with mathematicians. And I agree with that, and there's been a, certainly a lot of work in mathematics and the mathematics education about problem solving and the difficulty of students. So thank you, that's important. Uh, in terms of TAs, how do you handle the trade-offs in terms of their time, that the, time, the demands on their time by their research groups, and the res I would imagine that there would be resistance from the research groups on having their students involved in teaching more than the usual zero after the first two years or something? Uh, yes, and I think that's an important constraint. I mean, graduate students have a lot of things they have to do, and our goal in producing the system is to make it take no more time than they would normally put in, in fact, less time. If you have an efficient, effective process, it should take less time to implement it, and our TAs believe that. That, and our department has a policy, actually, of how many hours a TA should put in on their TA. It's, I, if you can keep a secret, because our university doesn't know, our department says no more than between 16 and 17 hours. Now, of course, the university pays them for 20 hours, and we will swear to the university that that's what they work. But and that includes everything, prep, walking from this class to that class, talking with students, everything. So we try to account for all of their time because you're right, their time is precious. It's precious to them, it's precious to their research groups. And so we, we need to honor that. So less time is better. It's very good to challenge the issue of, of maybe reducing pencil and paper computation that you bring up. It seems possible that we need to be working with our math colleagues to rethink what should be the math curriculum because the computers have changed everything. Analytical techniques are, are not general and the computational ones are because you can approach all the problems, both the analytically solvable ones and the non. And so we probably just are doing the wrong thing with mathematics. I also was intrigued to see someone question having calculators in courses because it's inauthentic to how physicists actually do their business. So something really needs to change fairly drastically. It's interesting you point out that it could free up some time in our curriculum. Yeah, and I think that part of mathematics is certainly a barrier to some students in introductory physics classes as well as the upper level classes spending, I mean, I spent a lot of time learning special ways to solve certain forms of differential equations in my graduate career and undergraduate career. And I'm not sure, I, and I don't use any of that stuff. I mean, maybe if you're gonna be a theorist in a very specialized niche, you're gonna use it, then you can learn it. When I wanna solve differential equations, I go to software, or I do it numerically. If I can see the solution, I mean, there are certain things I think you have to learn, and I don't have the answers to that. I mean, I just throw it out as a question that we need to look at. So, question for you. Uh, what happens when the instructors don't like it, the TAs don't like it, and the students don't like it? Well, then you have to fix it. <laughs> uh, then something is going wrong. Uh, and so I think we've been pretty successful on the whole, and that doesn't mean they're not individual disasters, because QC does give you individual, you know, find the measurement and you patch up those measurements. But by and large, when we survey our TAs, and every so often somebody in our department gets a bright idea, especially new faculty, they come in and say, this is not the way we did it. Wouldn't it be better if we made TAs the way we were doing it? and the questionnaire then goes out to the TAs, and 
it's happened five or six times over this 25 years. And every time it's pretty unanimous, the answer is no from the TAs. They like this because they can be successful and it doesn't take more time. Students, you know, they're not dropping out, which is, I think, the ultimate measure. They're not getting Ds and Fs. They're getting really high scores on all the quality assurance measures that we do from the community. Uh, do they love physics? Not necessarily. But they don't think it's a bad thing. And in fact, when our engineering school surveyed engineers out, I forget now, five or 10 years after they got their degree, and they asked them what were the most valuable courses they had, the biggest answer was the introductory physics class. And that helped us immensely because we're in the College of Engin Engineering, essentially. College of Science and Engineering, of which science is here and engineering is there. So I don't know if that answered it or not. I wonder if you'd say a little more about, the, uh, you mentioned the idea of a national, G or national a TA training program and the need for customization within different context departments, roles for TAs, um, and how that, how you'd advocate for a national program but allow for those things. Okay, I mean, uh, I could refer you to Jordan. Jordan, are you here? There he is. Talk to that man over there from the University of Utah as one of the people who runs that program. So I think it's a very important program and it does emphasize adapting things to local conditions. And, and that's also very important. So my TA program may not look like your TA program, but it should have probably certain things in common, or at least we've looked at the processes in the same way. And so I think if you really want to know more, speak to Jordan. Is that OK? Uh, I wondered, I noticed you very carefully did not say what topics should be eliminated from the introductory physics curriculum. I wondered if you have a, f a list of favorite topics. I, I don't. I mean, I, I, uh, we have, because we're a huge university, we have seven, I think at last count, different introductory physics classes. And because we're a big university, we have this advantage of, of tailing to a population. So for example, in the physics course for engineers and physical sciences, we threw out things about fluids, things about thermodynamics, things about complicated things. One of the reasons was they would get that in their engineering classes. On the other hand, for our course for biology majors, I, the IPLS course, those are exactly the subjects we put in. And we threw out, hold it, momentum, among other things. And, you know, we consult with our biology colleagues and say, you know, do you really use this? Is this an important concept? You got to make these tough choices. So I don't, I don't think there's a list. I think that you look at your local situation and who your customers are, and you make these really hard decisions. I mean, I'm a particle physicist. Throwing out momentum is like cutting out my right arm. But, okay. Yeah, Ken, this is a, a great talk, really inspiring. I wanted to go back to the uh, TA question. And uh, my, my question involves the uh, gap that a TA or a graduate student has. So they take their first year classes and they TA to get to a research group. Then they're in the research group supported by research funding. And uh, how does that teaching mentorship continue or how can it continue? through those years where, and, and this big goal maintained that, uh, the goal to become a quality teacher. Yeah, I, that's a good question. And of course, not all, I think most of our TAs TA for maybe one and a half years. I mean, they don't get into a research group till after they've passed some hurdles and things. But, uh, but we do certainly have TAs who only TA one year. Uh, and I think the, what we try to do there is we do the best we can in that one year to infect them with, uh, with the teaching and the theory of teaching and the literature. 
and infect them with being successful in teaching so that they know they can do it and they know what students can and can't do. And then they go off to their research career and at some point the, 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 they come out the end and actually there may be at least one such person here. Um, and at some point they decide that they want to maybe go into academia. And of course most of the PhDs don't, but a good fraction do. And at that point, the university actually has preparation for future faculty classes. And they take those classes. And so the university has something for the end. Now, a lot of times in our situation, especially now, your research funding is not continuous. And there are breaks in people's research funding, in which case the students go back on a TA and then they become a experienced TA. And so what we do with the second year TAs is they get orientation, I hate to use the word training because it's not really training, it's education, about being a leader and being a manager. Where the first year TAs, man, they're just trying to survive. Right? The, T, the first year of graduate school is really hard and uh, they're trying to survive, do their classes, to teach, to take, get ready for a written exam, you know, get into a research group, and, and so they're just, they're just worried about their classes. But the continuing TAs actually have more time, and they, because they have more knowledge, and we, we talk to them about these leadership and management roles. But not for everybody, people sort of leave the system, but it's amazing how many Remember it. Sorry. I think she's next. Oh, well, just a view from the outside as a, as a sort of consumer of, of Minnesota graduates. I, at NC State, I was often on the interview <laughs> circuit for the hot young researchers who came through. The, we were trying to hire people in spintronics or biological physics or whatever. And, and they would come and talk to me because they should talk to somebody who cared about education. So. And the conversations that one had were often, uh, yes, there's a research field called physics education research, and yes, there actually is, there are techniques that one might, and then, but some, occasionally someone would walk in and they'd say, oh, I was a graduate student at the University of Minnesota, and the conversations were incredibly different. I don't know what it was about what you did. But they, they'd say things like, I've always thought teaching should be a collegial effort, you know, people should work together, I, you know, I'm really concerned about students' conceptual development. They, you had a completely different kind of conversation with these people. And so their two years or one and a half years as a TA in those, in the, in those settings made a huge difference in their way of thinking about the teaching part of their careers, what they would do as a faculty member. So whatever you're doing, it, it, really, it really mattered. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, I, I do want to emphasize it's from that point of view that we think if we could get 30, 20 to 30 institutions who produce the most PhDs to do something serious with the TA time they already have, that we could make a big change in the flavor of faculty who come out and how they enter the institution. I mean, for us, it's always we get these new faculty in and it's always a slog. Not always, but mostly a slog. They don't know anything about teaching. I mean, they think teaching is doing what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry. So just to follow up on uh, faculty development and TA development, and uh, on, you mentioned in the early part, you were talking about the apprenticeship model, talking about scaffolding, providing some guidance, and then slowly removing it. And then you presented the, the Pentagon kind of uh, activity theory model. Um, how does that apply to TA development and faculty development? This, you know, what does that look like that ends up with these wonderful people? But what does it look like, the scaffolding, the removing of guidance, the providing of guidance, and the apprenticeship model when it comes to building faculty? Okay, so well, scaffolding, yes. Uh, the first year TAs, I mean, we have a lot of scaffolding. We have things which are called mentor TAs. 
And mentor TAs are experienced TAs, but they're not the best TAs necessarily. They are TAs who work well with other people and can help guide them. And they come and they visit TAs and observe them and give them useful feedback. And they do not report to the faculty unless they see something dangerous, which almost never happens. So mentor TAs is a piece of scaffolding. After the first year, people, a TA, experienced TA can request a mentor TA to visit, but normally they don't on a regular basis. Uh, other scaffolding we have is the orientation, where they do a lot, well, a lot for physics graduate students, reading of not quite the seminal papers, but the important uh, papers for everybody that have been written. And I could flash up a screen, and you will recognize the names of the papers. I see Lillian right there. So one of her papers is there, and uh, uh, Mike Martinez's paper is there on problem solving. So, so we have students read it around, and that's part of the scaffolding. After that, they don't necessarily, but we hope they do. So there's a lot of scaffolding, and I think at it, your own institution, it's important to, uh, to, put, to see what your process needs as scaffolding and put it in and then take it away. Okay, we'll have our final question. Sorry, we'll, we'll do two more. Chandra, stay. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, thank you for the very interesting talk. I wanted to follow up on Ruth's uh, observation and wonder if you've done... Um, so these, you've prepared these TAs and they go off into different contexts, maybe small schools, maybe in large schools or whatever. And I wonder if you've um, done any sort of formal investigation of how are they able to uh, take what they've learned and what are they doing in their new context? Uh, I, just an anecdote, I have a friend who teaches at a engineering school in the Big Ten and he, he says his dean specifically came to him and said, you better not spend more than five hours a week on your teaching. Like that was the command from his dean to him, if you expect to get tenure here. And I'm not saying everything's like that. Those, those are you know, anecdotal, but it'd be interesting to see follow-up evidence about how they're able to function in a new context and what they took with them and are able to do long-term. Thank you. I mean, it, it is this, uh, the box that was faculty acculturation, which is an important part. And the, and, the, and the hope is that by bleeding enough people who don't have that attitude into the system, that we will change what the faculty acculturation is. Now, we haven't done anything formally about tracking you know, the University of Minnesota graduates for the last 20 years. I've wanted to do it. I just don't have the, the resources and see what they're doing in their teaching. I mean, I, I come across them all the time. Uh, there are some here. And uh, you know, not the PER people, because we know the PER people are knowledgeable and wonderful, but the, uh, <laughs> So there. <laughs> uh, but the people who are not PER people, but just went through the system and got the regular research degree. And, and I do think that's a valid thing to ask. I mean, somebody needs to do that. And uh, we would be grateful if anyone would want to do that as a study on you know, what our TAs and, and other TAs, what happened to them as they go through. So my question was also related to <clears throat> the same thing that uh, Ruth was talking about, which is that somehow University of Minnesota students, even if they come as faculty uh, in traditional areas of physics, they seem to have a very positive impression of teaching and learning. And uh, one of the things that I was going to say is my student, Melanie, who, graduate student Melanie, who's sitting right here, she did a survey of the graduate students in our own department in which she was trying to look at what their uh, views were of the same physics problem scenario posed in different formats. One of them was a context-rich problem, something that you guys do day in and day out at Minnesota. At Minnesota. And other formats too, like uh, you know, um, textbook style problem or multiple choice format or bro problem broken into parts. And students were asked to actually rank order them in terms of their instructional benefit how likely they are to use them, and also provide reasoning for that. And she actually interviewed lots of students, individu uh, TAs individually also. And as you can imagine, all of the TAs actually rated pretty much all of them because the rating was the lowest for the context-rich problem. You know, they really absolutely hated it. In fact, you should look at her paper. And uh, 
and basically the reasons they would give is that this is not a physics problem. You know, I, I, I think it, it has a good story to it, but this is not a, what a physics problem is supposed to be. So I will never give it to my students. So both on instructional benefit and how likely they were to use it, those problems actually rank the lowest. You are saying that at your institution, the TAs are the ones who actually always go back and say, no, we, we are sticking with it. And I have experienced exactly the same thing that Ruth is saying about your students. So you're doing something really well. So I want to see if you, if you can unpack a little bit what you are doing, because you're giving this very inspiring talk, but you're also doing something that is really well done. So okay. can you unpack it? I would it? love to give you the details, and I have about another 10 slides, which we don't have time for. But also, I think what my point here is that there is no secret sauce. It really is examining the process and looking with measures and with observations about what goes on and what influences the students. Now, one of the things that influences our TAs is their being successful. Okay, and I think that's the most important thing about teaching. And it's true for the faculty, too. If you can make a system where the faculty or the teachers or the TAs are successful, they will like that. People like being successful. And they, if they're not successful, they will have all kinds of excuses about why whatever it is they're not successful in is not important. Uh, so I think the point is to make a system that's successful that is not overbearing, and, and I should tell you that when we started this, you know, the first time we started, the TAs were spending like 22 and 23 hours a week doing that. And we, you know, we found that out. We said, no, that can't happen. And you just go through your process and you, and, and you fix it. So I think it's about the process. The, the idea that um, students, um, that, well, the idea about the context-rich problems if they find the students can actually solve them, and in fact, they're easy to grade, which they don't look like at the beginning. It looks, I mean, those things look ferocious, but the point is if you know how to solve problems, they're not. I mean, they're, what I showed you was the block sliding down the ramp. It's the same old problem, but it just means you, the student, has to make the decisions, and the TA has to grade for those decisions. And, and we do teach the TAs effective ways of grading that, that actually Pat taught me. Uh, and so we look at the details where they're spending the time and we teach them to do whatever they're doing more efficiently and more effectively where they get instant feedback that it works. It doesn't seem like it would work, but it works. And that's all, you know, that's what I can say. And I can, you can go to our, our PER website, by the way, and we have all of our TA orientation materials there. And you can look at all of that, and we, we, we're happy to talk to anybody uh, about, about real details. I mean, we learn from other people, too. And we, you know, steal and borrow. But again, you can't just copy. It has to fit your institution. And, and I think the key is success, really. If they're successful, doesn't take more time than what's not to like. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heller. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. We'll call the session to a close. If I could get my fellows who are still present to come back up for a photo. Thank you.